This morning we're going to be finishing chapter 2 and we're going to begin in verse 5 and let's go ahead and start our study of our new section this morning. In verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 2, it says, For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And we've already established that it was Jesus who created all things in our previous studies. If you've missed them, then you can go to our website or to the church app, and you can find out the backstory of what we have studied thus far. For without Jesus, nothing was made that was made. On day one, let there be light. On day two, the atmosphere or firmament, firmament was created. On day three, the dry ground and the plants. On day four, the sun, the moon, and the stars. On day five, God created the birds and the sea creatures. And on six, on day six, he created land animals and humans. So on day six of creation, we read in Genesis chapter one, verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God, as you read, and obviously this is a huge scripture pertaining to the Trinity of the Lord in the plural form, let us make man in our image. God created mankind in his own image. He gave man the position of dominion. He made him to rule over all of his creation. Adam tended to all of God's creation. And this was a place of both honor and great responsibility. Now, to be contrasted with the angel's purpose. The angels of God, their purpose was never to rule over God's creation. That was not the reason for which they were created. God did not appoint angels to tend the garden, to name the animals, or to have dominion over creation. That was given to man alone. This is important. It was given to mankind, God's greatest creation, to have dominion over all that he created. God breathed life into man, making him a living being. A living being capable of knowing his creation, knowing God's creation, to know the creator in a personal way, in a lasting way, a spiritual being in which God would worship or be worshiped in spirit and in truth by those he made in his image. Now, man is not an animal, though there are sometimes we think that they act like such. Well, man, that guy is such an animal. You know, typically that's not used in a complimentary way unless maybe you're an athlete or something. Man, that guy's an animal out there. But man is above all creation. He is above the animal kingdom. I just recently read of someone who's very well known that referred to man as being an animal. This is important to understand that man is not an animal and that God created him above all of creation. It's important to understand regarding the origin of God's plan for man because there have been and there currently are evil angels, fallen angels. We refer to them as demons. Uh, And they have perverted God's creation by influencing mankind to go against its creator. See, here's some insight for you today. Satan and his demons desire to rule, not to serve as they were created to do so. The angels were created to serve God and to carry out his wishes. The angelic office, though very powerful, is an office of servitude, to carry out as messengers God's will. Yet Satan did not desire to carry out that mission in his proper place, but he desired to be like the Most High God. He said, I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. Another thing to note is that angels were not created in the image of God. You were. I was. Man was. We were created in the image of God. However, as we have spoken of the spiritual realm in which a spiritual warfare wages... Man will either be under the lordship of Jesus Christ or they'll be under the influence and control of Satan. 
You have to understand this in the world that we live. Under the lordship of the demonic realm, as mankind will serve the lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the eyes and the pride of life. And all of these things are demonic. They're of this world and they are passing away. And because of that, the created things are going against their creator. Against God's purpose for each member of creation. And so when you think of things from a spiritual position, angels were not created. Let me say this again. Angels were not created to rule the world. But for those that had fallen, those angels that had fallen, they would seek to usurp not only God's position, but they would also seek to rule over man taking his position. This is important because that position of rulership over man and over creation, God over man and man over creation, that door of authority was given to the devil when sin entered this world. When mankind chose to rebel against God's commandments, the door was flung wide open for Satan to take that place of dominion that belonged to man over creation, and it would even seek to take the place of God's rulership over man. We read of this in Romans 5. In verse 12, and then I'll read from 17, 18, and 19, it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and we know that as the man Adam, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. All sinned. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came, so when man sinned, God's judgment came resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, Jesus. The free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. A simple way of explaining this is for those of us that like watching the Olympic Games. You'll have one man or one woman that will represent a country, and when that person wins, the country wins. When that person loses, the country loses. And so if you think of team mankind, when Adam lost, mankind lost. When Adam sinned, mankind now became subservient to the lusts of the flesh, to the sinful nature, and then the consequences of that sinful nature, which was eternal separation from God and death. But as Paul writes to the church in Rome, through one man's righteous act, through this man, Jesus Christ, many would be forgiven, many would come to righteousness. Because of this, in this day and age, it's become incumbent upon godly men and women to subject themselves to the design and the purpose and the position of God's creation. You know, this week in California, and we talked about this in house groups, how Prop 1 was passed, and you wonder how in the world with so many mega churches in California can there be a, a proposition instituted into our state constitution that allows abortion up until the point of nine months, or even as it would be interpreted up to the point of birth. I mean, how does that happen? That's not God's design. Jesus said that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He said, I have come that you might have life and life abundantly. He created it. He breathed life into mankind. But Satan has come to rob, to kill, and to destroy. And we've had people that are against God, rebelling against their creator, who have voted for things that are completely against God. It was man that was created to rule over this earth. Right now you can look around and you can clearly see the work of the devil in the world where mankind through their sin is worshiping and serving the creation rather than the creator. 
It was man that was created in the image of God. It was not the angels. Furthermore, in the world to come, yet again, it will be man that reigns with Christ over the earth and not the angels. And the point is this. There will come a point where mankind will be restored to the position he was created to hold. Now, I wonder if there are any of you that have ever wrestled with sin. I don't know. You guys look pretty perfect to me today. If you've ever wrestled with thoughts that you wish that you didn't have, desires that you wish that you were there weren't there, like well, all of these things that we deal with on a daily basis, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, moral relativism, what makes it right, what makes it wrong? How do I determine you know, what is what when there's so many different options out there? What do we do when we've fallen so far from the place that God has intended us to be? What do we do when we're not under the control of the Holy Spirit, but rather as if there were a demon there tempting us with the lusts of the flesh and we bow down before him because he wants to be in control of our lives and those demonic oppressions that we wrestle with? You have to understand that this factually is what is happening in the spiritual realm where the devil sought to usurp God's position of rulership over man. And so now mankind is controlled by sin. Mankind is controlled by the lust of the flesh. But why is man so important? We read now, Quoting from verse eight of, excuse me, Psalm eight in verse six, it says, But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? And maybe some of you have wondered that too. Well, what is man? What is life? Why is it even important? Who even cares? You know, we're like on a on on this planet that's a speck in, you know, in the in the galaxy. Why is it so important? Life is important. God created it. And every life has value and every life has a purpose. And it's meant to be lived in relationship with the creator. He says, or the son of man that you take care of him. You've made him a little lower than the angels. But you have crowned him with glory and honor. You set him over the works of your hands. This is what we read of in Genesis. Let us Make man in our image. Let's give him dominion over all things that were created. And so mankind was crowned with this glory and honor of having dominion over God's creation. Even though it may seem that man is insignificant, God has honored him and has created him for a great purpose with great value. It says in verse 8 of Hebrews 2, you put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. And why is that? Because of sin. After brilliantly and clearly writing that Jesus is above all creation because he is the creator, and understanding that mankind was given a very special place of rulership over the world, that angels are ministering spirits, but man is restricted to the physical world and the laws of the universe. Angels are not. We see that there is a little bit of a difference between the angelic being and the human being. Angels, they're aware of our realm. The angels in the spiritual realm are aware of the physical realm, but we are not aware of theirs. We cannot see what is happening in the spiritual realm, but those that are in the spiritual realm can see what is happening in the physical realm. And it's probably a good thing that we can't see what's happening in the spiritual realm because we probably would be institutionalized as we try to process things that were not meant to be seen. But for the fact that the angels can see into the physical realm and we can't see into the spiritual, this would be considered an advantage that man does not have. Spiritual beings, the angels, they're not restricted by the laws of matter in the universe, meaning that, yes, they can pass through objects that we cannot. 
The spiritual realm is superior to the realm that which is physical. And Paul wrote about this in Ephesians 6. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so though the spiritual realm may see our realm and we cannot physically see into the spiritual realm, we do have guidance and understanding that it exists, and that we must discern things in the spirit in order to understand what's happening behind the scenes. And so when Jesus, who is the creator, the one by whom all creation was made and is held together became man, he himself subjected himself to the physical universe which he created. Jesus, fully God and fully man, identified himself with sinful man who had fallen from his God-ordained position in creation. Jesus added to his divine nature, human nature. He was, and pay particular attention to this, he was not half God and half man. It wasn't a percentage of each, like he was a percentage of God and a percentage of man. No, he was fully God and he was fully man, 100% of each. And chapter one established the divinity of Jesus and chapter two is now establishing the humanity of Jesus. The reason why this is so important because, is because one of the first heresies that went into the church that permeated the church was a heresy referred to as docetism. It did not deny the divinity of Jesus. It denied his humanity. They didn't say that Jesus was not God. They said it just seemed like he was a physical man when he really was not. God, Jesus, fully God, fully man. Not fully God seeming like he's a physical man. Not like he would walk on the sand and you wouldn't see his footsteps because he was a phantom. No, he was fully God and fully man. And God placed all things under man's authority. And so as Jesus would be fully man, he would be fully in the position of man exercising his God provided right over creation. You know, there's a very fascinating scripture found in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you want to jot this down or turn there, it's 1 Peter 1 verse 12. It says, to them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So those Old Testament prophets, all those that were before Christ and the gospel being laid out, the plan of salvation, all of those leading up to the birth of the church, they were ministering to things which have now been reported to you. Like, you see it. It's fulfilled. But at the end of verse 12, it says this. It's this very obscure little end of a verse here where it says, the things which angels desire to look into. So again, in context, this is speaking of how the Old Testament prophets were speaking of things that were beyond their own day and their own immediate audience, things pertaining to the redemption and salvation of mankind. This subject of salvation, this subject of how would God, or this question of how would God redeem man from his sinful state was something that the angels desired to find out more about. The angels were intrigued as to how God's plan of salvation would work out and God demonstrated his wisdom as he would show his plan unfolded through Jesus, his only son, dying on the cross for the sins of the world, rising again on the third day, and becoming now the head of the church. This is something that the angels looked into. Because angels are not all-knowing. So often it's presented that, well, Satan is equal with God. And there are these two divergent, you know, opposing forces that that are going against each other in equal power. No, that's absolutely not true. Angels do not know the future. That is 
set aside alone as an attribute of God, his omniscience. Angels are not all-knowing. They didn't know God's plan in advance. And so you have now this massive, unseen spiritual world that is intrigued as to how the plans of the Lord would come to pass. We have all of God's physical creation. It's so vast beyond measure. We're so blessed. Yet as small as the world is in the universe and as powerful as almighty God is, he is mindful of man. He is mindful of you. He's concerned with your well-being, and he has crowned man with honor above all creation. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him? Back in Hebrews 2, verse 6. Or the son of man that you take care of him. This is speaking to a near audience and to a far audience. The near audience is dealing with the nature of humanity. The far audience is going to be dealing with what's referred to as the Messiah, a messianic psalm speaking of the Son of Man, God, fully man, walking on this earth, that you take care of him. Verse seven, you made him a little lower than the angels in the sense that the spiritual is above the physical. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. And it would seem that this promise is not yet fulfilled. Man is not over all things in the fallen creation. Yet, in spite of that, we see Jesus, fully God, fully man, over all creation. In verse 9, we see Jesus. And this is the first time that the name Jesus is mentioned in this letter to the Hebrews. It's the first of 13 times that you'll read it. He was made a little lower than the angels. For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So here's the idea. In his humanity, Jesus sharing our humanity is a little lower than the angels. Jesus became like a man in order to take man's place on the cross. Paul writes to the Philippians on this subject in Philippians 2, verses 6 through 9. Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. This is the message of the gospel for the whole world. And I would like you to notice, if you're taking notes or have a highlighter or a pen or a pencil, I'd like you to notice the comparison that is given between verse 7 and verse 9. With mankind in verse 7 and the Son of Man, Jesus, in verse 9. In verse 7, you read, You made him a little lower than the angels, but you've crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. Man's position. That's not an angelic position, that is man's position. And in verse 9, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So on one hand, you have man, who was given the authority over the physical world, but lost their relationship with their God and lost their position because of sin. Yet, verse 9, Jesus... Fully God, fully man, crowned with glory and honor through suffering, the death of the cross, reconciling mankind back to himself. Taking man that was lost in sin, no longer under the lordship of God, his creator, but had sold that place of authority and position over creation, had allowed the position of God to be usurped in his own life by allowing now the creation to rule over him. Instead of the creator, Jesus came, humbled himself, 
even to the point of death on the cross, that he might set in motion the reconciliatory process of God redeeming man and creation. That's why we read that it appears that it's not yet fully here because we're still living in this world that is under the control of sin. Yet through those who have placed their faith in Jesus, they are now no longer slaves to sin, but are a child of God. That though we live in a fallen world, that at one point, at one point in the future, God will come. He will rule this world. He will create a new heaven and a new earth, and then we will see all of the promises of God in full effect. But in the interim, we no longer are slaves to sin. I no longer need to say yes to the lusts of the flesh. I have been given the ability and the power and the freedom to say no. I will not give in to sin. No, I will not have the lust of the flesh. No, I will not have the pride of life and the lust of, eyes, I, of the eyes. I will serve my, crea- my creator, my savior, my God. Jesus made this possible. And so Jesus, fully God and fully man, was crowned with glory and honor through his suffering of death on the cross to reconcile mankind back to himself. As we already read in Philippians 2, verse 9, Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In verse 10 we read, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Jesus made all things. Jesus holds all things together. It was fitting that Jesus would take the place of you and me to redeem that which was lost. And it was God's plan from the very, very beginning. This word called proto-evangelion. Found in the book of Genesis, the first mention of God's plan of salvation for mankind, for sinful man, hot off the press, press. Adam and Eve had just sinned and God already had the plan. It was fitting for the one who created all things to take man's place. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In order to bring many sons to glory, it says, Jesus, walk this human life perfectly without sin. He was obedient to the Father, even to the point of death on the cross, even though he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So the plan of God's salvation was perfected through his only son, Jesus. Being perfected is not speaking of Jesus as if he was imperfect, but rather this is speaking of the plan of salvation perfected through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory to make captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he, verse 11, who sanctifies, sets the church apart from the world and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. In John 17, verses 21 through 22, Jesus prayed this. He said, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. Jesus, through faith in him, we have forgiveness of sins. We're no longer separated from God. We've become one with Christ. And did you catch this that we just read here in verse 11 and 12? 
verses 11 and 12, where Jesus calls us brethren, brothers and sisters. He's not ashamed to call me his brother, you his brother or sister. I wonder how many times we've acted ashamed of him. Jesus, the one who created all things, holds all things together, calls you brethren. How many times in this life, though Jesus isn't ashamed to call us family, that we don't want anything or anyone to know that we're Christian? We don't stand up for what's right. We don't let our light shine. We act ashamed of the one who wasn't ashamed of us. It's something to think about. Because quite frankly, we've all sinned. We've all behaved ourselves in a way that does not glorify God. Yet it pleased the Lord to lay on Jesus the sins of the world. Your sin and my sin. Yet in spite of how we would act and the mistakes that we would make willingly and sin we would commit knowing that it was wrong, Jesus still was obedient to the point of death to make our relationship with God possible, to redeem mankind to himself. And so in the midst of the assembly, that's why we sing praises to the Lord. And hopefully we'd be able to do so outside of the four walls of this church building. In verse 13, it says, and again, I will put my trust in him. And as Jesus was on the cross, there were those that mocked him. Do you remember what they said to him? Jesus, the very one who created them, they look up to him as he is on that cross, nailed between his wrists and his feet, as he's trying to pull himself up to get the weight off of his diaphragm so he can take a breath, as he's already had a crown of thorns. He's been whipped until his back was like, Swiss cheese, so to speak. And they look at him and they say, he trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. His enemies said, well, he trusts in God. We know that to be true. Jesus did trust the Father and he is the son of God. In verse 13, at the end there, it says, and again, here am I and the children whom God have given me, whom God has given me. You're his kids. You belong to the family of God, the kingdom of heaven. He's redeemed you. You're not a slave, you're a son. You're not a slave, you're a daughter. In John 10, 28, Jesus says, and I give them who have faith in me eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Nobody's snatching Garrett out of Jesus' hand. You can try as hard as you may. Not happening. And the same goes for you. And inasmuch, verse 14, then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. And who is that? The devil, it says at the end of verse 14. And why did he do that? So that he might release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. When Adam sinned, he forfeited his dominion to Satan. He forfeited his intimacy with his creator and God. For mankind, when Adam sinned, would now be enslaved to sin. And as we know from the scriptures, the soul that sins will surely die. Death entered this world. But Jesus, humbling himself to the point of death on the cross, paid the price for our sins, and he reconciled man to himself. What a blessing. In Romans 5.21, it says, So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus destroyed him who had the power of sin and death, Satan. I mean, isn't that one of the most amazing passages of Scripture speaking of what God has done coming in the flesh? 
If that's not amazing, I don't know what is. In Colossians 2, 13 through 15, it says, And you, being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, it says, having nailed it to the cross. In verse 15 of Colossians 2, uh, Two, it says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Who are the principalities and powers and the rulers of the age? Satan and his demonic realm. When Jesus laid his life down for the sin of man, the power of Satan was broken. The power of death no longer had any sting. Because though man was on a collision course to hell, Jesus bridged now the gap between sinful man and a holy and righteous God. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. The power that you think Satan has over you, crushed. The fear of death and eternal separation and damnation removed. This is the message of the gospel. I mean, look at the words here that Paul uses in Colossians to describe the great things that God has done for us. He has made you alive with him. He's forgiven you of all of your sin. He's wiped out the requirements of your salvation that were impossible and subsequently against you. He's removed all roadblocks that have been placed upon your path to heaven. He has disarmed the spiritually evil powers that were working to destroy you, having defeated them publicly in triumph. If we work our way backwards, when Jesus died on the cross, he was the fulfillment of God's promise in Genesis chapter 3. That proto-evangelion that I already mentioned in Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And speaking of the Messiah, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The striking of the heel, the death on the cross, the fatal blow to Satan and sin and death, It's the power of Jesus on that cross, laying his life down for the sins of the world and taking his life up again. He said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. And on the third day, Jesus rose again, not only paying the price for sin, so conquering sin, but conquering death. And that's why he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Jesus disarmed Satan and his demons. Since Jesus paid the price for our sin, what weapons does the devil even have against us? He will seek to deceive and instill fear, but he's a defeated foe. He is a deceiver. But you're no longer a slave to sin. You're a child of God. And in verse 16, it says, For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. What's interesting about this, and it makes sense, I think, in both translations, in the old King James Version, it says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, the nature of human beings. So Jesus did not take upon himself the nature of an angelic being as if he were the half-brother of Satan, as Mormonism teaches, but he gave aid to mankind. And this isn't speaking these, the, the children of Abraham. This is not an ethnic description here. This is describing those of the seed of Abraham, meaning those who are of faith in God. An angelic being does not know what it's like to be human. An angelic being does not wrestle with the th- same things that we wrestle with. An angelic being is not of this world. Mankind is. And because of that, we read the therefore in verse 17, that in all things, Jesus had to be made like his brethren. 
that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. So Jesus became man. He was fully God and fully man. He walked this earth for 33 and a half years until his death on the cross. As Jesus is described as the high priest, and we'll read more about this later in Hebrews, the high priest would represent God to the people, and he would represent the people to God. He was the mediator. He was the go-between. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Jesus was tempted, yet without sin. Do you remember how Paul describes in Romans 5 how through one man's sin, sin entered the world, all became slaves of sin? But then through one man's righteous act, many were brought to salvation. Did you know that both Adam, that first man through whom sin entered the world, and then Jesus through that man through whom righteousness and salvation entered the world, were both tempted by Satan in the same exact way. One gave in to the temptation and one conquered it. The same three categories of sin and temptation are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those were the things that Eve was tempted by and that Adam ended up falling into as well. Hey, that tree looks good. Lust of the eyes. Hey, I bet it tastes good. Lust of the flesh. It'll make me like God. The pride of life. The same thing happened with Jesus. Turn this bread or stones into bread. Hey, that will make me feel good. Look at all these kingdoms of the world. You can have all of them, Satan said. I give them to whomever I wish. Lust of the eyes. Oh, are you truly the son of God? Why don't you jump off the temple mount and as you float down to safety, all will know that you are God. The pride of life. It's the same exact thing that he tempts you and me with today. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Yet because Jesus was tempted in all points as we were, yet without sin, who do you think knows best about how to conquer the temptation? Jesus. Been there, done that, conquered it. Now this is how you can do the same. Jesus was attacked but did not falter. He was lied about. He kept doing what his father called him to do. He was abandoned by his closest friends, but remained faithful to his calling. Jesus was reviled, but did not revile in return. Because Jesus was tempted, and because he suffered, which no angel ever could or did, Jesus now is the one who knows exactly how you're feeling this very moment. That high priest that minister, that mediator, the one that meets you exactly where you're at because he walked in your shoes. He was tested. He was tempted. He was challenged. He was fought against. He was attacked. He was abandoned. But yet he served the Lord faithfully. He was perfect in all of his ways. And so when you're tested and when you're attacked and when you feel abandoned and when you feel like you're in over your head and when you feel alone and when you feel weak, and when you feel like you want to throw the towel in and just go back into the things of the world, Jesus knows exactly what it's like to experience those things. Yet he was without sin. And thus he is the perfect one to minister to you right now in your time of need. He can help you perfectly. In 1 Peter 2, verses 21 through 25, it says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That's the cross. That we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. The stripes of the cat of nine tails that was laid across his back. And verse 25 of 1 Peter 2 says, For you were like sheep going astray. 
but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of God. This is the reality of what Jesus did. We read the fulfillment of God's plan and purpose for salvation and reconciling mankind to himself. We see in the distance things that are yet to be fulfilled that we look forward to. But in all things, we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Mankind is in a fallen state. We raise up leaders that represent our fallen state. We go to churches where we can have teachers that will tickle our ears, that will tell us things that we want to hear, that align with our sinful practices, that don't tell us about sin, that don't talk to us about right and wrong or what pleases or displeases God. We've worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator where in essence we have allowed Satan and his demons to exercise control over our lives when it should only be God alone. We've seen this creation fallen, where mankind no longer has dominion over it, but has now seen the error of allowing Satan to pervert it and to taint it. But even in spite of all those things, God is on the throne. His plans, his purposes are perfect. His track record, impeccable. And as we grow to understand more about who God is, who Jesus is, man's position in creation, the value and importance of life, the stewardship of what God has entrusted us with, the great price that was paid because of our sin. It should serve as an impetus for us to seek and to pursue holiness, righteousness, and love that we would live in these days that we're living in, desiring to be on fire for the Holy Spirit, on fire for the Lord, to not be fearful of anything, but to go and do great things in the name of the Lord. God has a plan, and it will be fulfilled. He has a plan for his church, and it will be accomplished. And so I hope today that you walk worthy of that calling, that you walk worthy of that great price that was paid for you. As Jesus has set the example, may we follow in his footsteps. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to open up your holy scriptures and to receive from you. I ask, Lord, that you would help us to continue to not only grow in our knowledge and in our understanding of your word, but also to grow in our love for you. Because, Lord, without love, we can be like a clinging symbol, like a gong. It doesn't matter how much we know if we have not love. I ask, Lord, that you would please continue to build your church Lord, give us wisdom and provision as we step forward into what you've called us to be a part of and to do. And Lord, I ask that you would help us, Lord, in our areas of need as, Lord, we are pulled in so many different directions and as there is so much oppression and confusion and things that we're constantly fighting off and processing, I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't turn to anything but you. We look to you, Jesus, as you walked this earth, tested and tempted as we are, yet without sin, may you give us what we need in our time of need. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. If you need prayer for anything, our prayer team will be available on my right, on your left, usually over here against these blue mats. Uh, we love the blue mats, they add to our decor. Uh, but they're over there, and we'd love to pray for you. If you need prayer for anything, 
whatever it is, or for whoever it may be, for yourself or for a loved one, for a friend, somebody you don't even know, a stranger, an enemy, we'd love to pray for you because we believe that prayer works. And so today, as we close out with this final worship song, may the Lord bless you, may he keep you, may he cause his face to shine upon you, may he be gracious unto you, and may he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name.